Uh, so today's topic is a little bit of a, we'll have to wrap your head around noise. Okay. So it's not very um, intuitive uh, because it's not deterministic, right? Like all the other things that we have learned. So um, we, I have covered this at length in 618. Um, but uh, today we are going to take it one step. I will repeat many of the things that we have done in 618. Uh, for people who have not done 618 and you find this is too heavy, you can, we can give you the lecture number that you can review one more time hmm, for noise. But now we are going to take it one notch higher. At the same time, I will cover all the basics one more time because a lot of people change the hard disk after their semester is over, right? So then I have to recharge you again, right? So, okay. So uh, what is noise? So noise is the lower limit of the signal. Hmm? Uh, that can be uh, amplified. Uh, without degradation in its quality. Okay, so um, I'll give you an, uh, I like to give this example and um, unfortunately I don't have those two-way radios here with me. Uh, so the, the example we used to, uh, we used to, or I can give you a different example, right? Let's say all of you start talking here in this classroom and if we record that sound, let's say all of you are talking with the same amplitude, um, okay, and you are talking in your own mother tongue, let's say, different, different languages, we record that sound. Huh? And if we listen to that sound from certain location, which is distance is far away from wherever you are, then it will all sound like garbage, right? I mean, we won't be able to tell what's going on. Now, in presence of that signal, let's say that signal is available, and then uh, there are two people who are talking. Okay. And if, oh, sorry, not two people, one person is talking, other person is listening. Okay. And if that person's sound amplitude is the, about the same as the noise level, you know, whoever is talking in the, in the audience, uh, the other person will not be able to tell, correct? Does that make sense? You will not be able to tell what that other person is, uh, is talking about unless there is a very specific, you know, this is a great example of uh, code division multiplexing, right? So if the noise, let's, let's not get there. I mean, the, the original example I wanted to give was very different. Um, so if the other one person is talking something and the other person can kind of make out, when would that happen? Only when the amplitude of that person goes beyond certain value of the average noise which they are listening. And um, uh, that's what the power of noise is, right? Noise is pretty random. Uh, so you, you would like to make sure that you can listen to the desired signal in presence of that noise. Noise you cannot get rid of, first of all, okay? It's God given, right? So uh, that will always be there everywhere. In every phenomenon that, uh, that we encountered in nature, there'll be noise. Okay, and we can only quantify it. We can quantify or estimate the value of that noise. That's all we can do. And the deterministic signal, like what I'm talking right now and what you're listening, right, that's a deterministic signal. So that we would like to make sure that you can take the deterministic signal you're interested in and amplify it without degradation. And that's where, uh, that's the lowest limit. Uh, so if, uh, if we have to define the noise level of, uh, of, the recording, then it would be that level where you cannot tell uh, what that one person is speaking. Hmm? So if we uh, if we take our favorite example, hmm, let's say bias voltage, and let's say we take a resistor, ah. okay, and then you you all know right what's the value of the current going through this? Hmm? What will be the value of the current? Huh? Vb divided by R. No? So this would be the value of the current. Vb divided by R will be I. But that's what we think. Huh? That's our way of wrapping our head around it and saying that, okay, it's Vb by R. I know. Huh? So on an average, it's a, it's a correct, uh, correct value. But in reality, if you look at it, right, it's because there is a whole bunch of stuff that's happening inside this, inside this box. Some carriers are going from one place to another. Electrons are moving around. Whenever stuff like that happens, there is, uh, you know, uh, there is no, there is some average value effect comes in, some random motion of electrons will come into play. And then if you, if you actually look at this signal, and let's say if we amplify it really, this is the max amplification I get, you will see something like, you know, the noise value, it will, it will have some, 
So stuff like that will be will be there. The, so that's what uh, this is a ran random nature of the noise. Hmm? Um, so noise is random. Is random. But average power of the noise is not. And the average power of the noise hmm, is given by this. So a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about today is kind of repeat. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, don't fall asleep because somewhere in between I will insert something new. Okay. Limit t goes to infinity. 1 divided by t. And then when we are computing the average. Okay. So it's n square t. Dt, okay. And um, so what we are uh, what we are saying is that the hey t is long enough uh, to capture the lowest frequency of interest that we have. No, you don't want to do unnecessarily too much. So that's why we do this. Okay. And in frequency domain, we have we go from zero to infinity, and here in this case, it's the power spectral density. So in this case, this is a time domain, okay, and nt <coughs> is the time domain waveform that you're seeing, n square t integrate, you get the average power and we try to integrate it as for a high time, as much time as possible. In the frequency domain, we have something called power spectral density and then in this case, this number will be equal to same, limit t goes to infinity, 1 divided by t. So in this case, let's say I'm saying x subscript here, so we should say x square t hmm. zero to so this is power spectral density of x of t. Okay, so um, and then um, we don't want to deal with the continuous time domain information. We would like to deal with the frequency domain information because that becomes very useful when we have some filters and things like that, which we're going to study, right? So this is what we like to generally move to. Hmm? Okay. So if you look at the spectrum of our noise, huh, there are the first one that's defined generally is called double sided side band. Sx. F and this is F and minus F. It's a two-sided spectrum. Okay. Now, when we uh, deal with RF circuits and you're doing a lot of uh, like graphical analysis, right? Uh, you will see frequency translations and all those things. There we use this kind of spectrum. Okay. But for all other calculations and everything that we are doing, we, we use something called, for convenience, we use single-sided spectrum, okay? And difference is very simple, I'll show you. So the single-sided spectrum that we are used to, so that we can quickly wrap our head around is something like this. It's just 3 dB higher, factor of 2. So we take, you know, on one side and we say, okay, that's my noise spectrum. Okay, all right. And so this is scaled up by and this is Sx of, and uh, so it's for, this is one-sided frequency spectrum. So two-sided is used for graphical analysis. You're going to learn all these things. And this is actually used for circuits analysis. If you want to do noise calculations, we're talking about power. So power will be 3 dB. If you look at amplitude, that will be 6 dB. We know that, right? 10 dB, uh, 10 log of ratio and 20 log of ratio. Hmm? Okay. And then, uh, so even in measurement equipment, that's what you will see. So you have to keep this in mind when people are talking about either uh, double-sided or single-sided. Now kind of some of the repeat from what you have known. Let's talk about a resistor. Hmm? Thermal noise. In resistors. So um, we won't get into the, the details of 
uh, you know why the noise happens it's a brownian motion of uh, thermally agitated charge carriers in a conductor right and they, they, that causes randomly varying current so if you have a resistor let's say this way r then um, it's denoted by a voltage source and we denote it in this fashion and what's the value of the noise do you remember And this is a current source, which is a, this is a Thevenin equivalent and this is Norton equivalent. And square and this is resistor R. Okay. So, the mean square uh, voltage noise density hmm, is Vn square divided by delta F. I am going to explain all this is given by 4 kT R hmm? and the units are volt square per hertz and similarly current I n square divided by delta F is equal to 4 kT divided by R. Hmm? So, this is amp square per hertz, units are important. Okay? So, delta F is the measurement bandwidth. And K is our uh, Boltzmann constant. And that's 1.38, 10 to the power minus 23 joules per degree Kelvin. And T is degrees Kelvin. Okay. So, if you know the value of the resistor, you know the voltage, uh, mean square uh, voltage noise density of that uh, that particular resistor and it's given by 4 KTR. So, if you have a higher resistor, the voltage that you will put in here will be uh, proportionately high. Again, it's a square. Huh? That's what you have to remember. And similarly, the current value will be like that in that fashion. Huh? What is it? Mean square voltage uh, for that resistor, right? The resistor will have some noise and I'm just representing that uh, so, this Vn is what I am showing you, okay? And if you have an In, then I am showing you, okay? So, let me, uh, I mean all this stuff will sound abstract, but let us take a numerical example, then things will be very clear to you. So, if I take a resistor value of 1k, oops, then let us calculate Vn divided by, now here in this case, I am, uh, I am not taking the square. So, as soon as you do that, then you have to look at square root of f. Okay, and this value um, you can substitute in uh, 4k <coughs> times 300 degrees k times r which is 1k. Hmm? And if you calculate that, it will come out to be 4 nano volts per root hertz. Okay? So, that would be the, uh, the noise uh, um, uh, value. Okay? And this would be, there is no frequency term here. Okay? In this, in this particular expression. And we are talking about uh, the spectral density. So, it is going to look like this. We are talking about one sided, F is here and then it is going to look like this. It is going to be flat and this is, I am plotting here, V n square divided by delta F. So, the what would be the value? This would be 16 times 10 to the power minus 18 Hmm? Volt square per hertz. Huh. Yeah. Here I took a square root. Should we go through that? Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Here it should be. Let's take square of that. I'm sorry. You are absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. Forgot your name. Joel. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Okay. Did you get what he said? He absolutely caught me uh, red-handed here. Uh, this expression is actually for V square by uh, frequency, right? Uh, uh, delta F. Okay. Uh, this delta F is confusing, I know, but now I will explain to you. Okay. So what I'm plotting here on the uh, on the x-axis is frequency, and on the y-axis I'm I'm plotting the spectrum uh, pow power spectral density. Okay. And what it's telling you is that if I take one hertz frequency okay here so if i just take a narrow slice of 1 hertz okay and if i measure the noise power 
in that. That will come out to be uh, this value. 16 uh, 10 to the power minus 18 volt square. And if you want to look at the absolute voltage point of view, then you will take square root of that, which is 4 nano volts in 1 hertz bandwidth. Is this part clear or should I go over this again? Anything confusing in this? This is all uh, kind of I'm re repeating this, but you should not get stuck at this point. Okay. So, uh, let me uh, maybe visualize the experiment for you, right? So, you have a resistor and let us say we, um, the resistor value is 1, one kilo ohm. And now we are measuring using a spectrum analyzer or let us say some way of measuring the power, power meter. And then we put a filter here of 1 hertz bandwidth, some ideal filter that we used. Okay? And then we measure the power on the other side. What will you see? You should see 4 nanovolts. Uh, you should see 4 nanovolts and we call it RMS actually because you are just measuring the RMS power there. Okay? Uh, because we are measuring it in 1 hertz. So, let us say you, you widen the bandwidth by 1 more hertz. What will happen? Huh? Will it be? Socho. Huh? Root 2. Is that clear? Because there is a square root of hertz in the denominator. So, if you if you widen the bandwidth by 4 hertz, okay, then you will go down by, uh, basically you, you will, uh, the factor of 2 will come into play, okay. If you look at the square value, it will, uh, the square value will go up. Just keep that in mind. So, um, let us look at effect of transfer function. Hmm? So, this is called white noise. What does white noise mean? It is uniform to from DC to infinity, okay. So, and that is the way it is represented, okay? it is white noise because there is no frequency dependence term in, in, in this in this particular expression, okay. So, for example, if we took a such white noise which is flat hmm? and then we put it through a filter, hmm? let us say low pass filter, huh? this is linear time invariant filter response. So, this has a low pass filter as such a response, okay. What would we expect at the output? Hmm? This is my S of X F. What would be S of Y F? What would you expect? It will get filtered down, right. The filter will, you know, that is why we like to deal with in frequency domain. It is easy, very, very easy to analyze this. If I give you uh, a time domain transfer function of a filter, and if I give you a noise in filter time domain, you will not be able to say, how do I deal with this, right? So, frequency domain, all the stuff uh, we can easily tell, right? So, then um, probably it is very easy for you to then say that, oh, okay, since the filter does not have any um, any gain so far, you, are, you will get the same corner frequency as what was here. That is what you would expect, right? So, the, the low pass filter output noise, yeah? this is what we will say. And I am assuming in this case the low pass filter does not have any noise, it is not contributing any noise. Hmm? Okay. So, um, so what we say is S of Y F is equal to S of X F and then H of F. H of F is the transfer function and in this case I am just taking a mod of it, magnitude response. Hmm? So, this would be the PSD, power spectral density at out. Hmm? That is what you will get. So, for example, if you have a one pole filter, then what do you see? 1 divided by 1 plus omega divided by some uh, corner frequency, right? Let us say omega divided by p, let us say, okay? Then you would, uh, you would make this look like 1 over 1 plus j omega divided by p, pole frequency, whatever that is, right? Then uh, what would be the spectrum of this? This would be 1 divided by 1 plus omega square p square. Okay, mod would be that. So, that is what we have to do. Uh, now, let us uh, talk, I am introducing many terminologies to you. Um, sometimes I may give analogy which may sound not perfect. So, bear with it, but uh, once you understand, uh, then, then, then you will get it. So, the next terminology you need to learn is you, you have not been exposed to, it is called available hmm? noise power. Okay. So, imagine you have 10 bucks, okay, 
and you met your twin who's exactly identical to you, right? Then both of your well-being is important, right? So you cannot just hog on to the 10 bucks to yourself. What's the available money that you can give it to the other, your twin? Five bucks, right? Because both of you have to survive, so you will equally divide it. So that's where this maximum power transfer business, uh, maybe not a perfect analogy, but I think you get it, right? So if you have a resistor, let's say, hmm, R, and then uh, that resistor will have certain noise, which is Vn squared, correct? And if I have another resistor, which is your twin, hmm, and this resistor is noiseless. Hmm? So we know that maximum power transfer requires your Rs equal to Rl. Hmm? So this, uh, uh, this would be, uh, you know, the two resistors have to be equal and the other resistor is a noiseless resistor, okay? So what's the available noise power from the resistor right now, which is this one, okay? So original noise power was Vn square, which is equal to 4 kT R, hmm? and this was per root hertz, V square, okay. So in this case, P available hmm? noise in bandwidth B. So slowly I'm introducing uh, concepts here, okay. What is the P available noise power uh, in that bandwidth? First of all, if I apply noise Vn, what would be the noise voltage here? Vn divided by 2 due to the resistor. So Vn divided by 2 and divide by the resistor R. So that would be square of that. Got it? So this would look like Vn square divided by 4R. Okay. And what was the Vn square originally? That was equal to 4 kT R. Now, since I said in bandwidth B, I have to multiply by bandwidth B everywhere. Did I do it right? Yeah, okay. Did you get what I did just now? Okay. So this goes away, this goes away, and this is equal to KTB. So what is KTB? Available noise power from a resistor in a bandwidth B. Now, what's interesting about this is, what's interesting? It's independent of the value of the resistor, which is kind of a little bit disturbing at, at the first, uh, first sight, right? Okay. So, because the bandwidth is coming into play, that's the reason. All right. So, P available noise hmm, is equal to KTB. So, it's proportional to temperature, uh, proportional to bandwidth and independent of R. So what is it telling you? Basically, if you want to minimize the noise, what do you have to do? It's an obvious thing you should attack. Huh? To cool the, to put it in the refrigerator, right? Your device, you take your cell phone, put it in the refrigerator, it will work a lot better. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. So, you know, all these super cool devices, you know, they're talking about, this is the reason. You're just trying to cool the damn thing down so that you can reduce the noise. Temperature, you reduce the temperature. So this is uh, like, but then cooling that down takes a lot of work, right? So you're spending a lot of energy to cool something down. So this is, may not be in our control. And most of the time, you are not going to design devices for, you know, some application like that. You're going to design it for human application. So you have to deal with the temperature of minus 40 to 150 degrees if it's military, okay? So you have to deal with then the highest temperature. So T is even higher, you have to deal with, okay? So this is kind of important. The second thing that's in your control is bandwidth. So many times you would think that, oh, I'm working on high frequency circuit, right? So I should get the maximum bandwidth possible. Here is a problem. If you, if you have a, if you use wider bandwidth than necessary, a key, key word is necessary. So if you, the, your boss told you, hey, design a, you know, filter with a 500 megahertz bandwidth around this, in this frequency, center frequency. And you said, 500 is easy. I'll do one gigahertz. Uh, right there you have a problem because now you are integrating the noise in a larger bandwidth. And the overall system performance will suffer. Is that clear? So you should design with the bandwidth that's enough, good enough for whatever your application is. Hmm? So the least required bandwidth for your design you should use. Otherwise the noise, everyone is going to come along for the party. So you have to have a door which is small enough so only few people will come in. That kind of thing. Hmm? So uh, let's take some numbers. So uh, for one hertz bandwidth, hmm? the P available noise 
is given by kt since i am using 1 hertz and we can this is going to be equal to 4.14 10 to the power minus 21 i am not doing the calculation here watts per hertz all i am doing is i am putting k value um, and the temperature is 300 k okay and if we um, so this number by itself is kind of hard to remember right uh, so what's our favorite way to remember things convert to dbm power is dbm and when you do b dbm what do what do we do how what would be the can somebody can you tell me what the dbm value of this is all of you please do it you know just use the calculation i mean i gave you this number just wait let let everybody give it a shot yeah just wait. let let, let. DBM. Everybody knows how to do DBM, na? Quiz hai Monday ko. Bhool gaye. Huh? Ek minute, ek minute. Huh? Last bench, yeah. Can you tell me? What's the value? Can you calculate? Minus 174. Everybody gets this? Minus 174 DBM per hertz. Okay? Power per hertz. Voltage per square root of hertz. Keep that in your head. Power per hertz and voltage per square root of hertz. So what I did here is I divided this by 1 milliwatt. Okay. And then I said I will take a 10 log of this number. And that's when this minus 174 dBm comes into play. Everybody knows, right? How to do this? No problem. The next, so as you can see, this lecture is a lot of definitions. We are, we are dealing with lots of definitions just so that uh, we kind of get used to using these definitions. Because as we go along, before we get to the transistor, you need to know all the foundations. And that's why we are doing all these things. So I think if you remember a couple of lectures ago, there was IP3 we talked about, intercept point. So now we are kind of going in the noise direction. Intercept point was when your signal is so high, right, you're distorting. Now this is, you are going in the other extreme, where you are reducing the signal as low as possible to see what's the minimum level signal, what's the maximum level signal. And that's all the game is. Okay? You have to deal with minimum signal, maximum signal, and make sure that all the circuits that you design, they work under all those conditions. Okay. So um, the next part uh, we want to deal with is something uh, for passive circuits. Okay, so um, if you if you have an ideal passive circuit which is using L's and C's, will it contribute to noise? It will not by itself. It will not have anything to dissipate the power. Passive circuit cannot dissipate the power, but it has any non-idealities. Let's say it has a bad Q. Inductor has some resistance. The capacitor has some resistance. That resistor will start dissipating the power, and then suddenly the noise comes into play. Huh? That's a basic concept. So if you have a lossy passive circuit, then you will have noise contribution from that. So typically, um, uh, what we uh, what we do is let's say you have an impedance. Hmm? Uh, let's say in a in a um, let's say there is a passive reciprocal network. Okay. I'll give you the definition of reciprocal uh, because I'm kind of going otherwise out of the out of the train of thought here. Um, and let's say you can represent that uh, passive network. Okay, this is let's say passive network. And I am looking into the passive network and I see some uh, Z out looking into that passive network. And this will have a real part of Z out plus j times imaginary part of z out. Okay, now you see why I am telling you this example. Then what would be the noise coming out of this network? Will this have any contribution? Imaginary part of the z out, it won't. It's only the real part. Because the real part, the part is the one which is going to dissipate power. Okay, so uh, what we do is if we, so let's say this is my z out, which is, real plus j times imaginary, okay, 
then the noise part v n square we say that's equal to 4 k t again r and in this case it's a real part of z r. This is the trick we use many times um, when we when we look at complex impedances. Hmm? Next part I'm going to tell you is uh, about so this is all lumped circuits, right? That we are talking about so far. We are not talking about transmission lines. All lumped circuits, resistors, capacitors. Okay. Now the next part you will will have to deal with. It's um, I just want to kind of deal with the noise part uh, when it comes to uh, concept like an antenna. A lot of RF designers struggle with that because you're not able to deal with what's this antenna business. That's not my domain. Uh, so antenna, what is antenna? It's like a transducer. So you you provide an input voltage, and what does the antenna do? It radiates the power as an electromagnetic wave, and that antenna radio electromagnetic wave, which is radiated a few kilometers later, somebody can receive it, and they can listen into it. Right? That's what we do. We use constantly. So this radiation business. What are we doing? The dissipating power. Makes sense, right? Without dissipation, the, the, the without any work done, uh, you cannot really uh, do anything. So, this radiation kind of is represented as a radiation resistance of the antenna. Okay. So, for example, if I have a, let's say this is my, um, power amplifier of your cell phone or whatever and you are uh, connecting it to an antenna okay and here you are transmitting uh, radio waves right so when you are designing you cannot really look at the antenna and simulate anything uh, in the in a simulator so we look at the radiation resistance okay and then we say oh the radiation resistance is 50 ohm or 75 ohm, whatever that antenna's radiation resistance is, we take that into account. So, we generally design for that R radiation. Okay. So, you will be given that number when you are designing, so that the antenna people don't want to get into the MOSFETs. Okay. So, the antenna people are, they are different, genetically different people. Okay. So, they deal with uh, electromagnetic waves and they will say, okay, my antenna will represent like, uh, you know, resistance. So, you design for this particular resistance, that's what happens, okay. So, although, so it's good to have background in antennas also. If you're taking an antenna class, you know, you'll be, uh, you'll have a, you'll, you'll kind of go from digital software, DSP, uh, mixed signal class, analog class, and then RF, and then antenna. That will be the ultimate thing, if you can, if you can get that class, right, um, as a completion. The next one here we're going to talk about is, let's say you have an LNA, low noise amplifier. So, in case of the low noise amplifier, you can say that, okay, I'm receiving some signal and um, the, the radiation resistance, okay, is going to be uh, what I'm going to look at it at the, at the input right here, something like this. And here it will be the, the noise associated with, with this will be 4 kT uh, R radiation. So, Applying the same definition, Vn square delta F for antenna is equal to 4 kT R radiation. Now, uh, something that you have probably been exposed to, but I will go through it one more time. So, if you have a resistor and if you have a capacitor, and this looks like a one pole filter, right, R and C. So, the capacitor, does it have noise? No, it's a passive, ideal passive circuit. Resistor will have a noise. So, this will look like Vn square, correct? And what we will do is, this will look like a filter, one, a one pole low pass filter, right? So, then you would see the response will be like this, okay? And what would be the response at low frequencies? If I'm plotting the power, this would be 4 KTR. And after um, 1 over uh, 2 pi RC, it will start dropping, okay, because of the, the one pole. So, at one, 1 over 2 pi RC, you should see 3 dB drop. F3 dB frequency, okay, here it should be 6 dB because it's, uh, I'm talking about power here, right? 
So if we look at the integrated noise, mean square noise. So that's V out square. Then you can uh, integrate from let's say 0 to infinity. So the original, um, first of all, what is the value of the noise? Value of the noise. We are trying to figure out this V out hmm? over here. Noise at the at that output. What will be the value of the voltage there? You have a low pass transfer function, right? How do you calculate that? Hmm? One over SC divided by R plus one over SC. Correct? Voltage divider type of equation. So this will look like. I will keep erasing this. So, what would the transfer function look like? Hmm? 1 divided by 1 plus Rsc. And then, uh, since we are doing square, you have to look at the mod of this. So, what would that be? S will be j omega, correct? So, then this would become 1 plus omega square R square C square. Everybody is familiar with what I am doing? Okay, alright. So, that I am going to do this here. So, it would be 1 divided by hmm, 1 plus omega square r square c square. That would be the mod of uh, h of uh, uh, f, uh, h of omega square. Hmm, and then multiply that by our, what was our uh, vn noise? That was fixed, right? So, vn square coming in. And then um, uh, we were calculating over, uh, we can change the variable. Okay, so we would do D of omega RC, correct, and then uh, this would become, uh, because we are doing it over frequency, right, F, so then this would become 2 pi RC. So this will look like, um, I'll, I'll write it in detail first and then we will do, so this will be 4 KTR. Hmm? 1 plus omega square r square c square hmm? and then um, um, then we can say okay I'm so sorry I should change this variable that's what I did this should be x square and then this is dx and this is divided by 2 pi rc are you following what I'm doing I mean you're already familiar with the final result I, I would imagine but I'm just going through the steps again one more time okay and then this would look like what would the uh, this part is you know right integrator integration of this dx divided by 1 plus x square is tan inverse of x right and then 0 and uh, infinity that would give you pi by 2 hmm? so then this would become uh, 4 ktr hmm? divided by 2 pi rc times pi by 2 is equal to so pi will go away and 2 2 2 go away R, R goes away and this is KT over C. This is a well-known result. So, what is this result signifying? That if you have a, if you have a resistor and if you, uh, if you have a capacitor, right, and if you filter it down and look at the total output noise at the output of the filter, it's KT over C. It has nothing to do with the resistance. It's only the capacitor, right? So, then, so the only way to reduce the noise is if you can reduce the bandwidth of your circuit. Okay, so here in this case you have a bandwidth, you know, so you have to increase the capacitance. If you increase the capacitance, then the uh, then the total noise at the output will reduce. Hmm? It's independent of R. But if you increase the capacitance, what's the outcome? What will happen for circuit point of view? Area will increase, of course. Then, huh, say that again, Ajay. Huh, sleeve rate, or you have to use some amplifier to drive that capacitance, right? So then you will have to put in more power, you have to put in more current to get the same output. So you will be dissipating power and you will be increasing the area. So you don't want to overdo this again, okay? you do it just enough so that your design is practical. Now so terminology wise, uh, there is something called noise bandwidth. Okay? So if you remember, we did this, correct? And then uh, this was 4 KTR, okay? and this integration business it's okay for first time, right? Then uh, every time you cannot keep doing this. So you define something called noise bandwidth, which is, uh, let's say, I'm going to say equivalently, I'm going to define a noise bandwidth. But in this case, 
beyond that noise bandwidth there is no noise okay so this is my f n b w noise bandwidth hmm? so is defined saying that okay if i have that noise bandwidth then 4 ktr times f noise bandwidth hmm, is equal to kt over c okay so i'm taking the entire integrated spectrum and i'm saying that oh it's just a equivalent number that i'm dealing with which is f noise bandwidth and this f noise bandwidth value is going to be equal to uh, 1 divided by 4 rc okay so this is equal to pi by 2 times your f of 3 db bandwidth that you are used to say okay again if these are different terms there is something called noise temperature also so it's a equivalent temperature you know noise temperature that that you deal with uh, i think yeah noise bandwidth i have used uh, i have seen but at least i am not exposed to as much usage of noise temperature but maybe in some applications they do okay so i just wanted to you to know about it okay now we will get inside the mosfet any questions so far whatever we have done so what did we do so far let's review uh, because you think we are going a little bit fast right so i'll just recap again so that we talked about what is noise you know where does the noise comes from and how do you uh, formulate it mathematically so we can deal with it then thermal noise hmm? and uh, main thing we looked at is v square per hertz or v v per square root of hertz okay rms noise uh, voltage and power how do you deal with that and it's always defined in a certain bandwidth right so uh, that's what we dealt with and then this available noise power concept uh, that we talked about and what is available noise power ktb we figured it out and then uh, the key number that we want to remember is minus 174 dbm per hertz okay from the resistor and then we talked about passive circuits and then radiation resistance and then we went through a derivation of um, total integrated noise uh, from a you know rc structure which is kt over c and then there are a couple of definition either noise bandwidth or noise temperature okay so now let's get inside a mosfet so mosfet is a voltage control resistor so um, the definitions again the noise uh, is given by 4 kt gamma now this is a new term that you are exposed to delta f i think in the previous class uh, uh, you may have seen the the term gm and some other number right now we are kind of going into the little bit deeper details okay so what are these two things one is gamma is an empirical value and then uh, also called excess noise coefficient and gdo is drain to source conductance okay so let's say our device is in triode region so if it's in triode region what does it look like it looks like a resistance right and what is the value of that resistance we will figure that out okay so if you id is equal to mu n c ox w by l vgs minus vt uh, vds minus vds divided by 2 correct you are familiar with this expression so if you look at the value of the uh, id divided by del vds what is this going to be equal to mu n c ox w by l vgs minus vt minus vds everybody knows this right you just take a derivative okay now we we figure so if you if you look at the plot of i versus vds right it's going to look it's in a non saturation region or a triode region the device is in right so then um, the slope of this curve is going to be given by this expression okay and if where, where vds equal to 0 let's say vds equal to 0 which is very close to this region what will be the slope of this curve mu n c ox w by l 
VGS minus VG. And anyway, VDS is small when we uh, when we talk about transistor in non-saturation. Okay. So this is the value. So this resistance, so it, for uh, this is actually one divided by R on of the device. Okay. So this we would substitute here. Okay. And it because anyway it just looks like a resistor. So there is no other definition. It would look like the the value of the noise is I N D square is equal to 4 K T um, R on and delta F which is equal to 4 K T um, uh, reciprocal of mu n C ox W by L VGS minus V T. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that the G D O this is equal to G D O. Drain, drain to just one second. Drain to source conductance at the O. This represents VDS equal to zero. Okay, and in this case, gamma equal to one. Okay, when we look at a non-saturated device, I'm just formulating to fit into that formula. Okay, the original expression is this. Okay, gamma and uh, GD, GD zero. But when the transistor is in non-saturation region, it's a resistor. Okay, so if it's a resistor, then you have to just look at the R on of that resistor. So um, gamma will be equal to one for a non-saturated device, and GDO is what we just defined. Okay, uh, although you know that this value, what is this value representing that we are used to? This looks like the GM transfer function that we have learned, right? So uh, it's just that mathematically it looks like GM of saturated device, and we use that fact in op amp design and all those things all over the place right so that's that's the thing you have to so don't get confused between why is he talking about gm when the transistor is in non saturated it's just mathematical equivalence and that's convenient for us okay all right. in the saturation region I, I will go back again over this if there is any vedika you had a question oh, where are you gamma equal to 1 i think that's where your question is i i, I keep using the word conductance and resistance uh, flipped around, so you you have to. What did I do? What mistake did I do? Huh. Okay, one by R on. Did I make a mistake? I'm talking about current. Na? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, my bad, my bad. I did something wrong. Okay, excellent. Joel caught me again. So let me repeat this again. Okay, so. When we talk, okay, I think Vedika, your question was, you had, you got puzzled by this, which is good. Okay, so let's, good, because these mistakes will slow me down and then we will go over them again. So this is, we are talking about current. So you represent this as a current like this. Or, I mean, the arrow doesn't, arrow is not important because sign is, okay, so this is your I and D square. Okay, and in this case, um, so when you, when you are representing like a voltage, it will be 4 kT R. But when you are representing like a current, then it will be 4 kT divided by R. Remember that. So in this case, it is a GDO. Right? That is the first thing. Now in this uh, other case, we figured out this as a GD0 or reciprocal of R1. Why did I take reciprocal? Because it's del ID by del VDS. Correct? Okay. So now, in this expression, I, I made a mistake, which is why people got confused, is this is gd0 gamma okay and gamma equal to 1 and gd0 is equal to so this is the mistake i made so this should be am i correct now mu n c ox w by l hmm? is that correct all good okay thank you for catching that now let's talk about saturation region So, in the long channel device, okay, um, I n d square is equal to 4 k t 2 third g d o delta f. And this is what you are familiar with, right? And 2 third is what you are familiar with. So, this is our gamma for a long channel device, okay? Uh, sorry, uh, did I say gamma? Ah, yeah, gamma, correct. And then g d o 
what is GDO for this? Uh, it's going to be equal to our GN for a long channel device. And that's why we use that expression 4KT to third GM delta F, which is what I have explained or in the previous classes, but we have not gone through so much detail. Right? So uh, this is okay for a long channel device. Okay. So as soon as you uh, start getting into short channel device, I mean, start making, uh, they bring the drain and source together closer and closer, uh, then the electric field kind of extends beyond the E critical, right? We get all these other effects. And the velocity saturation effect, which we talked about last time, that comes into play. So then, uh, then you will have work done by the electric field. There's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, new electron hole pairs, uh, this hot carrier effect, all those things come into play. So all these things combined together, you're doing some work over there, which is what is compared to what you're used to, right? So then the increase in the noise will happen. And the way we uh, we uh, kind of you know look at that is we modify this gamma, okay? So gamma for long channel is two divided by three, and for short channel is two two three, okay? So that's the modification. Uh, what will happen is you you may start doing simulations and you think that uh, the device is actually uh, a long channel device, but when you simulate, you're getting more noise and you're not able to wrap your head around why my simulator is telling me the noise is higher when actually if I do the calculations, it's a lot lower, right? And this is what it is. So all these effects are modeled inside the, uh, inside the simulator. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, um, it's a very subjective question at this point. Uh, because what we are talking about is the influence of the gate versus influence of the source and drain region. So you really have to look at, I cannot tell a number to you. This is where, uh, but generally what we like to do, uh, 180 nanometer technology and you know, those are, those are fairly long, long channel. But there also what was happening was the gate was also higher. So now the gate is coming closer, closer. And then the, this is also going closer, closer. So that boundary kind of keeps changing slightly. Um, so what uh, the, the rule of thumb that I like to use is if you use a minimum channel length, you be cautious. So if you use a, if you increase the channel length, then you have the margin to go away from the long channel. Device. So, but some places it may not be important. Some places you're doing digital design, right? You know, you don't care about long channel, short channel. There you want short channel because you want as much speed as possible. Okay. So I can't give you exact number, Kiva. You know, beyond 40 nanometers, it's a long channel, short channel. Because you have to look at the process, who's coming closer. And all this stuff is kind of modeled very well in our uh, foundry parameters. Because they are all done empirically. Actually, they make measurements and they'll see. So that whatever you're going to simulate comes close enough. Okay. And... Um, we just don't like to like to stay away from the short channel as much as possible. And if the simulator is telling you, then it's the truth is what I'm trying to tell you because they are all modeled very well in the simulator. Next, um, something that you never thought was possible is gate noise. Okay, this is something that we have not talked about earlier. So what's really going on is if you if you look at our transistor, Okay, so this is my gate and you're applying some gate voltage and uh, what happens is um, when the transistor is, let's say, in saturation region, right? So then you have this pinch off region and all these are our carriers which are flowing from, uh, from source region to drain region, right? That's what is going on. Now, it's not like a uniform flow, right? They, whenever there is a carrier, um, the current is being conducted by the carrier, there'll be noise and in case of a in case of a uh, saturated device, we figured out it was two-thirds of GM that you have to take into account. Now, um, this current which is flowing from source to drain, 
it's not a exact number again there is some variation that comes along with it because it's a carrier transport so all that will cause fluctuations in the gate voltage okay so the gate voltage will also fluctuate as the current in the channel is fluctuating okay and that will essentially will induce current gate current noise current okay and that's what we call it uh, you know basically your noisy gate current okay and if you remember uh, last time we talked about van der zeel's model the last at tail end of the class uh, so uh, that kind of comes into help he did a lot of work in this this area van der where we we figured out the the resistance then we looked at the power gain if you remember uh, how much power um that non quasi static effect you know if you if you increase the gate voltage from 0 to 1 instantaneously it takes some time for the carriers to arrive and there is a dissipation that happens and we came up with a resistance number right so that's what we are talking about now okay so um the from the van der zeel's model the gate noise is given by 4 kt delta gg delta f i'm going to explain and this gg business is that what we did in the previous class which is given by omega square cgs square and phi times gdo okay i'm sorry this is not really uh, yeah let me change this delta okay what happened no we are talking about gate noise no so this gate okay my bad thank you this is gd this is what you're saying eh this is gd okay that's what it's given by okay and uh, uh, so basically uh, then what what we say is delta is equal to 4 divided by 3 for long channel device and if you look at the current noise it's increases with frequency there is a omega square term once you substitute right so it's called blue noise okay because it's proportional to omega so now let's kind of this is kind of a device physics type of thing that i told you right from this number how do we use this uh this theory to whatever we are going to do in circuit design right so let's kind of come from this back to how do we take this right so if you if you look at the this is the noise gate current and then if you remember this is cgs and let's say this is ggp the p is because it's in parallel right now okay so we can con convert that to series and how do we convert that to series series to parallel con parallel to series conversion we have learned right so then we convert this by saying that okay um equivalently i can say this will look like when i look at it from the gate point of view it will look like a voltage vng this is a gate current and i'm looking at gate voltage and i can say oh i have a series resistance called rgs and this is a capacitance what am i doing here okay so this particular model of this noise current gate noise current is really not um, digestible in its exact form right now huh? because every time i have to put up this gg value here and it has omega square uh, cg square and 5 5gdo right so then i want to um, rather than using a noise current uh, which is flowing here i would like to use a voltage hmm? like this at the gate instead of current so i am doing the transformation i will show you why i am doing the transformation and this is my vng square so let's go through that so what is the q of this circuit q is equal to the ggp is in parallel hmm? you should be familiar parallel circuit so 
GGP should be very small value, right? Or the resistance, parallel resistance should be very large value. If you are okay with resistor, let's use the resistor value. Resistance should be large. So then, omega C, uh, so omega C G S times R, R P. You remember this, right? Q value for the left circuit. So then this is divided by G G P. Are you with me on this? That we are used to, no? So then uh, the RGS value, I'm going from left to right. What do you think RGS value should be small or large? When we are going from parallel to series, it should become small. So then what do we do? We divide by 1 plus Q square, correct? So this will become equal to GGP. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. So this value should be equal to, RGS value should be um, 1 divided by GGP, correct? And then divide by 1 plus Q square, which will be omega square, CGS square and GGP square. Is that correct? Huh? And then of course, what do we do? We say Q is large, so then you can ignore the one part. No? This part we will ignore. So then what we get, uh, RG is, RGS series value is equal to GGP hmm, divided by omega square CGS square, okay. And then, uh, then we can also, then we will substitute this GG, uh, now you will see why am I doing all this stuff, right. The GGP that we have from here, we will substitute that there. So the series equivalent of the resistance is going to be equal to omega square CGS square divide by 5 GDO and then divide by omega square CGS square. So this will go away and this interestingly comes out to be 1 over RGS is equal to 5 GDO. Now it looks interesting, right? So suddenly we have a value that's equal to reciprocal of um, uh, 5GDO, okay. So what is this GDO value? Yeah, so um, one second. Huh. This is the drain uh, conductance, uh, right, uh, drain to source conductance. That's what we are talking about, right? Huh, correct, that's correct, yeah. okay. Um, let me come back to you on that one. Let me clarify this. Okay. I think I have made some mistake. If I am RGS, GDO. Can you look at the previous case? What did we do last time in final number? What was the value of our GDO? Huh. GM, eh? GM, same thing, yeah, so same thing, yeah, 5 times GM. This is what I wanted to make sure that I don't say anything incorrect. Yeah, it's 5 times GM, same value. Good. Sorry about that. Okay. Ha, mm bolo. -hmm. Mm. No, no, this noise is representing that um, GGP related noise. So we transform that here to a voltage now. No, 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 it's an rep equivalent representation of noise that comes along with that resistance. Okay, so we're just showing it like a separate noise, current noise, and here I'm doing it like a voltage noise. So this resistance is a real resistance, RGS, and it comes along with its own noise voltage source. That's what it is. Okay. So um, this reg uh, RGS uh, comes into play, and then so what is the noise gate voltage? Okay. So this is going to be four kT delta RGS delta F. Okay. Now this delta for long channel is equal to 
2 times our gamma, hmm? so this is equal to 4 divided by 3 and for short channel, it's going to be 2 times, uh, 2 times gamma and we already said gamma is, uh, can be, one, uh, what did I say, 2 to 3, right? Yeah, 2 to 3. So, you will get that multiplier effect. So, this uh, basically, all we are saying is that what is the equivalent gate noise? We are going to come to get through this, okay? Um, for most of the low frequency stuff, uh, you know, it does not come into play as much, but then if you are trying to do really high performance designs, then you have to look into this, okay? I am just exposing to you to all these things. The next thing we will talk about is uh, flicker noise. Okay. So, flicker noise happens because, uh, because of the charge trappings at the surface. Uh, okay. So, you have a device and there is a, there is a channel. So, whatever is happening at this surface, this is your oxide and channel. So, there is, uh, there are a lot of impurities at the surface. There are carriers which are with broken bonds, right. So, at certain rate, they will recombine and, you know, they will release whatever is going on and that is happening at a very low frequency. Okay, so this is a surface uh, or interface or interface. Okay, so they, we are randomly releasing, they are basically, uh, these are traps which, which are randomly trapping and releasing carriers and this is proportional to 1 over f frequency. Okay, now let us say you have a device which is of this size hmm? and what you find is that if you increase the size of that device by a factor of 4, hmm, then you, as you start increasing the area, uh, the effect will get averaged out more and more of this flicker noise, okay. So, then it is proportional to 1 over area. Hmm. So, let us say I have, and it is represented in, in this fashion. So, this is V n. 1 divided by f. That is a subscript that you would put at the gate. And this is given by k 1 over f divided by w l c ox and 1 over f. So, this k is a, again foundry gives you that number. It is based on all the measurements and things like that. Okay. And so, this is if you if you if you see uh, it is pro inversely proportional to the frequency. So, as you go to lower, lower, lower frequency, the noise keeps increasing. Why is the polarity? This polarity when it comes to noise has no meaning. Yeah, you can put it whichever way you want. I am just showing you, I mean I could put just a tilde there also. You are talking about this polarity, right? Yeah. As soon as I say noise, you should ignore the polarity. You are looking at root means, mean square additions. Huh? Okay. Now, if you look at the current value and in, when it comes to current, the direction you should not look at. So, for example, this current, I can show it this way or show it the other way around. So, you should not pay attention. The arrow is only showing that it is current and then after that, whatever I am writing is more important. I am square 1 over f. As soon as I say noise, then you should ignore the direction part. Hmm? So, in this case, this would be k 1 over f hmm? and in this case, you will get so, noise was at the gate first, from here we went to the drain to source, so it will get multiplied by gm square. Okay. So, this is gm square divided by w l c ox. So, this k 1 over f is uh, something to the order of 10 to the power minus 20, 28 uh, coulombs per meter square mm -hmm. and this is for a PMOS. And PMOS is better because the, the holes are traveling under, under the surface, you know, they are tra traveling deeper in the, but NMOSes are notoriously worse, okay. So, for NMOS, this number is, uh, you know, almost like 20 to 50 times more, this number, okay. So, um, in case of a PMOS transistor, Okay, the, the holes are carrying trans, trans current carrying right. So they are traveling under the surface. They are not traveling at the surface because it's a it's a it's a missing carriers. Okay, um, so they are better in terms of flicker noise inherently. That's what has been observed. 
and then n mos devices of course the electrons are at the surface so things are a lot worse so i'm just giving you two numbers i mean if you give your problem we will give you all the numbers okay so don't worry about that uh, so 1 over f uh, the k for 1 over f p mos is 10 to the power minus 28 and this is coming from the foundry okay if we plot 1 over f noise as a function of frequency then um, it will kind of go down like this okay so this is v n uh, 1 over f and we plot generally log n log so the 1 over f looks like this okay and then at certain point you will meet thermal noise due to the device so thermal noise due to the device would be all the other things that we did right uh, 4 kt uh, 2 thirds gm and all those things right so those things come into play here whereas the flicker noise will be higher as we go lower and lower frequency right so this is your 1 over f noise and wherever the two meet it's called flicker corner and this is let's say f of fc flicker corner. So, if we see k 1 over f divided by w l c ox and 1 over let us say at flicker corner f c it will be equivalent to our thermal noise. What is the thermal noise? 4 k t gamma divided by g n ok let us say for example. So, then our flicker corner is given by k 1 over f w l C ox and then uh, the GM will come in the numerator divide by 4 kT gamma. So, this will be equivalent to K 1 over F divided by 4 kT gamma and what is this term? Do you remember? GM divided by WL C ox. What does that represent? WL C ox is the gate oxide. Uh, capacitance to an order right if you ignore the overlap capacitance part then what is gm over cgs ft of the device right so or omega t in this case so this would be omega t which is gm divided by cgs so what's the insight from this clicker corner is k1 over f divided by 4 k t gamma and omega t divided by f. Na? What did I miss? Ah, correct. So, as the process gets better and better, okay, what, what do you expect uh, omega t to happen to omega t? You go from 65 nanometer process to 45, 40 nanometer, 28 nanometer, what do you expect with omega t? It will increase or decrease? it will increase right you will get better and better that is why. But then the flicker noise corner will also increase which means that uh, the thermal noise will not change because it will be decided by two thirds uh, whatever 1 over gm of that device right. So, this will not change but the as the process gets better you know you will see this happening. So, flicker noise gets higher and higher is that good or bad? It is bad because you are contributing more noise right. I mean I um, will I'll tell you where it is bad and where it is ok. Uh, so, uh, this flicker noise corner keeps uh, getting higher and higher as the process gets better. So, then what we end up if you are designing a low noise circuit then what do you do? You artificially increase your channel length and uh, channel width. So, you are kind of emulating the older process in a way right does that make sense? Right? If you increase your W and L then you are kind of emulating the older process. So, so you can get uh, so, so you have that flexibility if you want to do low noise uh, you know design. Uh, one quick thing um, I wanted to do uh, before I let you go is a typical interview question that is being asked about noise and specifically flicker noise right. So, if you look at the flicker noise hmm, and let us say this is 1 hertz hmm, and then let us say we keep going 1, 1 order, 2 order, 3 order, 4 order, 5 order and 6 order ok.
so let's say uh, the the flicker noise uh, okay here i'm i'm plotting v square by hertz okay, and this is my frequency so let's say at at uh, at 1 hertz uh, 1 hertz the value is here it's 1 micro volt square hertz does that make sense let's say at 1 hertz then if you go to 0.1 hertz what do you think it will be flicker noise huh? 10 times so it will become it will go here this way right and similarly you keep going like this and let's say at 1 microhertz what do you expect it will be I mean, I didn't draw the exact thing, but you can extrapolate it. Right? At 1 microhertz, what will it be? 1 volt square per hertz, right? Do you see where I'm going with this? Is there a dilemma in your head now? Did I cast it out? Why do circuits work? Because I'm going lower and lower and lower frequency. The flicker noise will make virtually impossible to work, right? Because at DC, what do you think will happen? This voltage will keep increasing, right? <coughs> Two ways to answer that question. One is, as you go down in frequency, your observation time also increases. Okay, so if you are talking about microhertz, if you are talking about nanohertz, right? Then you have to wait for a year to observe that, you know, the period, time period. Does that make sense? Okay, and so you, the circuit may not be on even for that time. That's one way to answer that question. The second thing is, we are always interested in integrated noise. So we always integrate from one frequency to another frequency. So let's say this is f of h and f of l. Okay, that's what we are interested in. So if you look at the integrated 1 over f noise, in let's say bandwidth of f of h to f of l, then it will be go from f of l to f of h, let's say constant divided by f and df okay and what will this come out to be equal to constant ln of f of h divided by f of l okay so even if i have a million number here you know one e to the power eight whatever number the ratio is so high uh, that you are you are looking at integrated noise ln will help you out so ln will make sure that you know this whole number is very small comparatively Okay, so that's the way to answer that question. I think rest we will start from the next next class. I have intentionally slowed down about 20% slower. Okay, thank you very much and good luck for your exam. That's on.